is Sarah Smith. She's with the Washington State University um, Extension, and she's going to give us an update on the sheep industry um, in the Pacific Northwest and some of the things that have been happening um, as of late with our pandemic. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to you. Thank you, uh, Melinda and Carmen. It's, uh, it's uh, great to be able to uh, be involved with this from, I just got to get to my screen here. Um, since I grew up in Idaho, I'm quite fond of the University of Idaho and the Vandals. So it's uh, nice to be able to uh, interact with this group. I wish that we were meeting under different circumstances. Um, slideshow. I just got to move the one button here. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking about the pandemic here lately. Um, to give you a little background about myself, um, my name is Sarah Smith. Like I said, I grew up in, in Idaho. We raised sheep. We did range bucks uh, down into southern Idaho. So quite fond of the sheep industry, still connected with, with some of those people uh, today work with the University of Idaho um, Sheep Center and offering some programs. And I'm excited about your new manager coming in. And I've already tried to kind of touch base with them. I had to cancel my shearing school that was scheduled uh, the first part of April. And so hoping for opportunities maybe to work with the University of Idaho in that sense. So what I'm gonna basically do is, is kind of talk through the sheep industry and what we were seeing, where we were at, what has happened. Also gonna give some information on programs that are coming up um, that I think as sheep producers, regardless of your size that you might wanna look at. Um, and also talk about what, as a producer, some of the things you can do. And, and nobody has not been affected by this. I mean, everybody from the large operations to small operations that are trying to get local butchers, um, people selling show lambs, uh, this is one that really has hit everybody and it really has hit all of our proteins here quite hard. Um, I work with food animals here in the Columbia Basin. So my work is primarily with uh, hogs, beef cattle and sheep going to, going to harvest. Let's see. So um, in today's seminar, what I'm going to do is kind of talk about what is happening in the lamb and the wool industry. I found it, I gave this presentation to Washington about a month ago, so it was kind of nice to go back and see some of these numbers. Some of them were very pleasing to me. I, things didn't happen as bad as I thought they could have. Um, other things, um, of course, are not good. So um, I'm going to talk about kind of pre-pandemic and post because there was some really good opportunities that we were seeing in the sheep industry. We also had some challenges um, before this pandemic hit. And so trying to keep this all in perspective of what was being done uh, from a national level, both from the USDA um, and from the ASI, I think uh, can be helpful. I should step back and say that in addition to working for Washington State University, I also sat on the American Sheep Industries Executive Board for Region 8 which is Washington, Oregon, California, Alaska, and Hawaii. So a lot of this information will come from some of my meetings that I sat in there um, in that sense. What is being done, some of the programs that are coming out that producers like yourself can tap into um, to, um, you know, it's not going to take away all the pain, but hopefully um, some opportunities to get some cash flow moving um, get some meat moving so that we can keep these lambs current. And then uh, as a producer, some things that you can look at implementing with your flock um, to try to get through these uncertain times. And um, if you have questions, go ahead and you can put them in the chat, you can ask them, or uh, we'll try to make sure we get them at the end. And I, I think Melinda and Carmen are, are watching those. And so if I miss something, just don't hesitate to, to chime in and ask me uh, what I was referring to. So um, when I talk about, I, I kind of break this into pre-COVID and post-COVID. And uh, the dates that I used for pre-COVID is our ASI convention. Um, not only was there a lot of resources, a lot of discussion that happened there, but it's kind of a good mark that was a, you know, we just started to, actually I remember coming home from um, convention and hearing the word COVID for the first time. 
but not really in any concept of what the implications I thought would be. Um, and then we'll talk about post, well, and I say post COVID, actually we're not out of COVID yet. Um, you guys in Idaho definitely are moving ahead a bit faster than us in Washington and I envy you. Um, but uh, I think the ramifications that we're gonna see in our protein production and our meat animal industry, it's gonna be felt for some time. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So from the wool and skin uh, standpoint at convention, there was a lot of concern around the market of this. It hadn't been good for the last year. They were very slow. And this all kind of went back to the trade tariffs that started um, back in 2018. Um, if you'll remember, uh, the first uh, tariff that came in from China was about 10% on our wool and our skins. Um, and then they upped it in 2019 to 25%. And if you look at those graphs there at the bottom, you'll see that uh, we have a significant amount of uh, wool that and skins go to China. That's our, our main market of our export market. So when they start putting tariffs on them uh, and people stop buying, it, it really hurt quickly. And then in 2018, a lot of Western wools, and when I say Western wool, I'm talking more about our West Coast, maybe not so much Idaho and, and Wyoming as that type of West, but uh, we definitely see a lot of wool um, in the Californias going into storage. Um, we basically had a wool lab that was, was somewhat dated, a person that was into retirement, and we didn't get some um, wool tests back in time and then the market crashed. And so a lot of people held that wool kind of anticipating maybe better prices in the next year. So a lot of people in California, it wasn't uncommon for them to say that they had their wool in storage in 2019. But they were hoping that if uh, those trade tariffs got lifted, if we found other trade avenues, that it would go ahead and move that way. And when I talk about some of our infrastructure strain, one of the big ones was this wool test lab, um, especially to go into international sales, but even some of our sales here in the U.S., especially with our military, we need um, micron testing done, and, and, you know, sometimes we do strength testing, and, and that information is needed for sales of wool. And uh, without a lab here in the US, uh, it became kind of problematic. So at convention, there was a lot of discussion amongst ASI, the National Sheep Improvement, and Texas A&M about organizing a, a lab here in the US so that uh, we weren't depending on another country. And we had good relationships with New Zealand. They said they would do it, but everybody's concerned at that time not was COVID, but was a foreign animal disease. And if a foreign animal disease came um, through either country, would it be shut down and we couldn't get our wool test? So there was a real commitment by the industry to go ahead and build this wool lab and, and the money was authorized. Um, but the lab was gonna take a little bit of time to, to build. It wasn't gonna be done until 2021. So ASI ha had made arrangements with the New Zealand Wool Testing Authority. Um, to test wool um, for our 2020 clip. Everything seemed to be proceeding along nicely, uh, especially for some of us, you know, we're up here in Washington. So we get some of our sheep sheared really about the first of January. We're on kind of the first bit before um, those crews head down to Oregon and especially into California and, and maybe go back into Idaho. So a few people had some tests done, but then once, um, April hit, you'll remember that New Zealand basically shut down and there was no product or, or no mail carry services going into there. And so no wool was being shipped. So there was no test being done at that time. And so I think it, it did prove to us that we wish that it was a year earlier that we had, you know, had this wool lab going, but it proves to us that we really do need a wool lab here in the U.S. Um, you know, this was not an animal disease, this was a human disease, but it still shut down borders quite quickly on us. So here, here's the bad news. Uh, when we look at the trade tariff, I told you about the numbers, the percentages. Well, here's the economic impact. And if we look at pre-tariff, um, you know, in the, before, uh, basically before 2018, we were shipping about four and a half million pounds of both wool and sheep skins to, to China. 
However, after that tariff, there was just a lack of demand. Um, those prices just didn't make sense uh, for people to be, to be buying it, to be manufacturing it. And so we saw a dramatic decrease, 88% um, on our, our, our wool and 76% on our sheepskin. And so those numbers hit really hard. And, you know, um, sometimes when people say, well, why are we talking about, you know, you know, I'm a lamb producer, not as worried about the wool. You'll see that for our sheep skins, you know, all of us that are in the lamb meat production, that uh, drop credit that we get for a pelt um, is very helpful in helping pay that harvest fee or at least making sure we don't have another discount or dock in there. The wool prices on the right are Australian dollars. And, and basically what I wanted to show you this uh, in this graph is how um, mid-year last year is when we really just saw those prices just go south. There was not a good market in Australia or the U.S. Uh, for wool and um, it just kind of crashed. And, and there's uh, numerous reasons, uh, just wasn't the manufacturing going on. Um, we had you know, a lot of supplies. So, so that really hurt in that sense. So when we look at our wool skins, here, here's the, the bad news, and, and this will shape into a little bit of post-COVID. Um, you know, typically we see pelts um, averaging about $3. Over the last couple of years, we've seen them even higher than that, depending on if um, other countries are buying, what the cold winters are like. Um, but uh, definitely I would always see a little bit of a credit for that pelt. Um, when we have those lambs harvested. However, starting with the, the tariff that we saw in 2000, um, late 2018, um, and then, uh, yeah, so that the, the yellow line does represent 2018s in there. So those pelts are off of what our high is. But 2019, we were already below uh, zero. People were reporting that they were having to pay um, either a rendering fee, a disposal fee on those pelts. And um, with the increased tariff that we saw, the 25%, it continued to decrease pelt values and as supplies continued to, to back up. And then you'll see that once um, COVID hit there in the end of March, there really has been no movement of pelts. And so um, they're basically the packing plants are having to render those and uh, some smaller plants might be taking them to the landfill or, or things like that. But that's um, basically that $2 cost is to get rid of those pelts. So instead of being um, a price that we get a little bit of credit for, it's now become something we have to pay to help get rid of. So um, the USDA, because of these trade tariffs, there were some programs that came out from from the USDA and, and the federal government to help mitigate what those tariffs were impacting. It's quite interesting, and, and a lot of this I get when I sit on that executive board. It's not something I followed a lot before, but it, it starts to paint a big picture that, um, as you see as we talk through this, some of it is going to be, um, we'll be thankful that we had some of this already in place, but sometimes we'll ask why we didn't get some of the other stuff earlier when I show you those drastic numbers and the amount of money that was lost. So the first round was announced in July 2019. It was really pretty interesting when we talk about the Market Facilitation Program, MFP, that's a direct payment to producers. There was none given to sheep, uh, sheep producers, and there was none given to cattle producers either at that time. Hogs did receive a little bit, but a lot of it went to specialty crops and uh, don't ask me why that is. I don't know if it's bigger lobbyists or if it's bigger impact. I mean, the sheep industry was definitely able to show, show impact um, or maybe the states that you come from, uh, maybe the Midwest had a little bit more pull um, with the US Department of Authorities that were making those decisions. However, there was still considerable impact that happened and you saw those numbers where wool prices continued to go down, pelts continued to go down, nothing was turning around. And so ASI um, in January made another request. So this is really before COVID had become a, a, th a, a big issue, made a request that uh, USDA reconsider giving uh, producers this MFP payment to help with that loss in wool and um, pelt value. 
And at that time, we still hadn't heard back from the USDA. Kind of were hearing that it was not likely that there was going to be funds to do that. But there, you know, the sheep industry was definitely able to show that they were negatively impacted by those tariffs. However, the interesting factor, and at first when this happened, I think we all were shaking our head why they did it, and um, is when the USDA, with this trade mitigation, they approved the purchase of $17 million uh, of lamb meat. And you guys will recall that uh, lamb meat isn't shipped to China, so our lamb meat prices were not impacted by the tariff. It, it was the pelts, but it was not lamb meat. However, they did go ahead and um, authorize the purchase of 17 million pounds of lamb. And I'll say um, from talking with producers here on the West Coast and even with ASI, we were kind of um, scratching our heads trying to figure out how they decided that and didn't really think it was going to solve the problem that we were seeing with wool and pelts. Hindsight now, we're glad we have 17 million um, dollars worth of lamb to be purchased. I'll talk about this a little bit later um, and when we look at our cold storage, but we definitely um, need that um, purchase to go forward and hopefully that will help out in, in some of those. There was some money given to ASI to try to develop additional markets or expand the markets um, for wool. Uh, the wool markets are very tough. It's a very high-end uh, wool. Typically, is very high-end when you start talking garments. And uh, not only are they very picky, but price points. And so ASI had made some ends with uh, Italy, Spain, um, and India to try to increase some of that demand. But it's a relationship that's built over time. So you weren't seeing big upticks, but there were some new buyers um, that were taking it. However, if you look at the COVID map globally, those, those uh, populations have been heavily hit. So you can imagine what, has, what I'm gonna say here and in a few slides later when I talk about what's happening during COVID um, uh, with our, our exports into these new markets. Um, so on the meat side of things, um, this is where there was lots of optimism um, at convention. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around uh, lamb markets. Um, I can tell you lamb feeders and buyers of lamb were very active. Um, we had some lambs here in Washington that uh, were feeder lambs looking to make their next destination either into a feedlot or into a grass setting. Uh, to be finished out. There was a lot of interest in those lambs. Um, also, lamb numbers were very tight, and you guys, especially in southern Idaho, uh, can appreciate this. Uh, that uh, hard winter that we had last year in 2019 that came in late in, in April and May and hit Utah hard and Wyoming and even into Nebraska really impacted our docking rates, and so um, there was a lot of loss in those lambs um, out of the mountain states which significantly impacted our, our supplies and these, these later lambs coming in to the to market here, um, you know, December, January, February. Um, they were staying very current. And you can see our, our um, dressing weights, our, our harvest weights were about four down, pounds down from our average. Um, you know, and feeders were very happy. They were staying very current. The packers were very happy with the lambs they were getting. It was just a really positive atmosphere. Um, it was, um, you know, lambs weren't getting too fat. Um, so things were moving nicely. I also saw interest, um, especially in the middle states, but even I saw some out here in the West for some people to, to grow their flocks. They were looking for some of those ewe lambs. Um, most of them were, if they were big flocks, they were preferring the, the finer white face use. Um, but there, there was some de demand there and there was some real optimism that with these tight supplies, um, with some market opportunities that had happened, that, uh, you know, it was maybe worth growing their flock herd a little bit. So there was lots of optimism prior to COVID-19. Uh, when we look at prices, you can see slaughter land prices were cracking up really nicely. I'll thank uh, LMI uh, livestock market um, information.
information center that provides these graphs for us. But uh, these are nice graphs to look at. When we look at the blue line, we can see that, uh, especially for 2020, we had um, slaughter lambs were tracking up really nicely. Um, and, and there was good interest there. And, and that's where with tight supplies and movement, there was, there was real optimism that we were gonna see good prices um, in all quarters, um, but especially in these first two, three quarters of uh, 2020. And when we go ahead and look at the traditional markets, more of our feeder lambs, uh, we were seeing lambs over, over $2 a pound. And I should note that, um, you know, they talk about traditional market being the Texas market. Um, so some of the sources that I talk to on that Texas market, it's become a more of an ethnic market or a non-traditional. They have become mostly a hair sheet market and, and sell that way. So that's a little bit skewed when we look at traditional and non-traditional because the New Holland is almost all um, a non-traditional type of ethnic market that how it goes out. But the good news for both of those is that feeder land prices were tracking over $2 a pound and there was good demand. Um, I've heard of lambs moving from coast to coast and there was very active buyers out there. Um, they were um, looking for lambs and uh, there wasn't just a couple buyers. There was you know, a handful of buyers or more really searching out those lambs. So um, that was, it really showed some good tendencies that way. So a summary of prior to COVID-19, two universities held steady the past few years. We did have a tight um, supply of lambs late because I, you know, how many we had lost. But earlier on in the season, the Midwest has definitely um, adopted this accelerated lambing. And so there's some, you know, decent numbers. So we hadn't lost a whole lot of lamb production. It's just that those, those Midwest lambs typically get finished out more more quickly than we do with our range uh, lambs that'll either go into, you know, a, a type of Imperial Valley or the Willamette Valley for, on grass for a while before they're fed out or um, before they go to the feedlot type of situation. Woolen skins, um, there, there just wasn't a lot of optimism. There's lots of trying to figure out ideas. Um, a lot of it was trying to get this uh, lab in order so that we could ensure uh, timely testing to take advantage of market opportunities and export op um, opportunities. But lots of optimism around um, lamb prices. So then the impact of COVID-19, and it's kind of interesting how this coincides. I was in uh, Washington, D.C. for their spring ASI meeting March 8th through the 11th. Washington was uh, breaking pretty good over on the west side. Um, Nothing had really been shut down yet, but there was, it was lots of discussion as I landed. Oh, you're from Washington. That's where all the breaks are happening. Um, but uh, one of the things that I'll say when we were in Washington, D.C., we were in multiple different buildings, the USDA, the Department of Interior, um, Department of Ecology. There was access to all of those. There was no mask wearing. There was no disinfectants. Um, we were, restaurants were full. Um, we were at a hotel where they had some basketball uh, tournaments going on. Those were all full. So there was lots of energy around. Um, there was discussion of COVID-19. I'll remember that uh, it was set in a meeting when Italy um, announced the shutdown of restaurants. And I kind of thought to myself, man, that, that's pretty drastic. And Ohio at that time had said that they were going to stop online classes. And um, I, I thought it was drastic. I didn't think it was a reality yet for us in the U.S. I, I think I was definitely still in denial. I uh, didn't see that in my crystal ball. However, I, I returned home. I, like I said, I was getting ready for our shearing school. Washington State University was starting to come down with some rules. I was still optimistic that we were going to be able to hold this school. I have about 22 students that come in and about 30 volunteers. So I thought I could make guarantees to keep things safe. And let me think, things changed so rapidly, so quick within three days, it became obvious to me that WSU was not going to let me um, have that school, um, not because WSU didn't want it, but because of state mandates. And then we started to see uh, school closures um, all the way from grade schools to universities, restaurant closures. 
Um, by March 24th here in Washington, we were at a stay in a uh, home order. And as you can see, I wish I could say that at my office, I uh, have those two cool sheet pictures, but that's actually at my home. So I'm uh, now having to work from home um, at this time until we're allowed to go back. So um, at that time, really on the East Coast, Lamb uh, or COVID had not been, had not broke and we didn't see any impacts. But uh, the next week, we definitely wouldn't have been able to be in those facilities like we were. So when we talk about the impact of COVID on the wool and skin, it was bad before. It had gotten, I mean, I don't know if it could get any worse. It was bad. We didn't have really any trading going on. Now we have absolutely no trading going on. I think the thing that's worse that concerns me a little bit is um, all markets are seeing seeing this, we're getting some backed up supplies, especially um, in our big wool producing countries like Australia and New Zealand. Um, there's two, um, I have the April 17th uh, Ag Market News Report, and it shows the exact same thing as the um, table that I show May 8th on there, this, uh, this one. Nothing's changed. There is no movement of wool. Um, whatsoever. And so a lot of wool is going into storage. Um, the problem there is, you know, a lot of times wool is a good cash flow for some of our operations early on. Um, not only are they not getting that cash flow, now um, they're having to either store at the farm or if they've already shipped, um, they're getting notices from the warehouse that there will be a storage fee because there's just not enough storage. So um, from that standpoint, uh, you know, that's uh, been kind of the, the dilemma there. The thing that I'll add, um, so when we go into storage, there's increased costs. You know, this is the last thing we need right now is increased costs. Um, as I told you guys, I work in the Columbia Basin. Uh, we're one of the top 10 producing country, uh, counties in the U.S. Um, most of our product is export quality, um, be it hay or apples or onions or potatoes, a lot of that stuff goes overseas. Um, and if you're talking with any of our, our people right now, they say the export market is not bad. There's some demand for hay, there's some demand for potatoes. The problem is there's no shipping containers. Um, they can't hardly find them. And so even if we wanted, even if we had the, the market open, and we have people who want to buy, the shipping containers aren't here to fill, to send them over. So even if we get some good demand for wool, the question is, do we have the shipping containers we need to, to go ahead and move those? So that's become one of our big hiccups now um, that we're seeing up here in Washington with our, our export markets. Um, Melinda, I see that it's uh, flashing through. Is there some questions I need to answer, or is it okay that way? Um, there's one question that says, why do we need to know about the virus effect on the market industry? Why? I think by understanding, you're going you're gonna to see how we're going to have to make some decisions going forward. Um, you know, there's going to be some backup of uh, products. Also, when we start talking about, uh, I'll show you some graphs here a little bit later um, of what our packing plants faced and when we don't have meat moving, then our prices go down. So I'll, I'll show those numbers here, here shortly. So from an assistance program, um, there is the wool loan deficiency payment program that you guys can, can use. Wool prices, especially for our fine white face, has been really good the last 10 years and really has not been utilized because there's not been the need to for it. However, I think producers need to keep in mind, especially if they haven't shipped wool, um, that this market assistant loan is there or a loan deficiency payment is available and uh, that if they need to get some cash flow, that's a way to go ahead and do it. So, um, with this impact we're seeing, if you need some cash flow, that's how you can go ahead and, and move some money that way. Um, the sheep industry, Sheep USA, um, American Sheep Industry has that um, wool LDP listed. 
The thing that you're going to need to know, and this is really important as we move forward with some of these assistant programs, most of them you're going to need to work with your farm service agency with, um, USDA farm service agency office with. So you'll want to make sure there's going to be a huge demand to be in there and have all your documentation so that when those come available that you can access those resources, especially if you're um, in a pinch where you have not been able to sell lambs, haven't been able to sell wool, you have a payroll that you're trying to make, or you're trying to buy feed for your farm flock, those are things that you'll want, want to look at that way. And so now the meat of the presentation, and I, I do have that as a pun intended, um, I think, you know, we talk about wool, um, especially for our, myself here in Washington State, um, we do have a, a couple range flocks, not as many as you guys do in Idaho, but still our main production, um, even across the U.S., is, is meat, and it's pounds of lamb. And so the wool is typically, um, a, you know, if we get two products off of them, but the emphasis is usually put on, on pounds of lambs and meat produced. And especially when we start talking about farm flocks, that black face or coarse wool, there's really just very little emphasis put both on a selection or a management standpoint for wool. And in many instances, I hear producers saying it's more of a hindrance um, because of the price they get um, to have the shearing or take the wool to the wool pool than, than the money they get from it anymore. Also, when we start talking about our West coastal lambs, uh, especially over there in the Willamette Valley, um, or even grazing over here in Western Washington or in that North uh, California coastal, those are very coarse wools. Um, definitely not the beautiful clip that you guys get off of your range flocks in Idaho and just has really low demand. So not typically where we put a lot of emphasis, but like I said, even in, uh, in our range flocks, pounds of lambs is, is typically what pays the bills and and where producers put a lot of emphasis on, you know, saving lambs, getting lambs to grow well and getting them marketed at that ideal weight. So wool prices were, you know, um, depressed already. So th there wasn't really a whole lot of thought to put a lot of emphasis in that area. A couple of things that I want to talk about the lamb meat market, and this will kind of go back to that question, why is COVID important? And this, this I think slide probably says it all. Um, lamb meat is a high-end consumer meat. It's a high price. Over 50% of our lamb value is sold in restaurants and on cruise ship, basically in our food service dining. And so when those restaurants get shut down, cruise ships don't move, um, we're in a world of hurt. There's, uh, a, I don't know if I might talk about it later, but there was instances we heard of where um, reefer trucks with lamb carcasses or lamb meat left Colorado to go to the East Coast. They got to the East Coast to unload. There was nobody to unload those. The restaurants weren't open. Those trucks had to turn around and come back home. So, um, you know, that was a dire hurt that not only did they not have the sale, now they have the cost um, coming back. So food services, um, is huge for the lamb industry is, and not only is it a big portion where we sell our lamb but it's also a very high value product that they're usually selling usually it's your your chops and your legs of lambs that that go that way and when we talk about uh food service and and retail um you a lot of people say well why can't you just move the the meat that's in that was supposed to go for food service into the retail to our grocery store it's really not always that simple. Um, how those animals have been prefabricated before, you know, and went into the cooler if they're frozen, to, uh, to uh, rework that could be problematic from a quality standpoint. But you've got to remember with COVID, and I'll show this a little bit later, is we started to shut down plants. We started to shut down uh, fabrication places. And so we didn't have the people, even if we wanted to move product that way, to go ahead and get it moved to retail. And that is, you know, that's one of the big problems we have seen in the beef industry. It's not that we have a shortage of beef or a shortage of pork. We don't have enough people in those packing plants to keep them working in an efficient manner to keep those animals moving at the level we need to. Um, so also you'll see, we'll talk about cold storage. There's a lot of lamb in cold storage. And, you know, a lot of people have said, well, why not just move that lamb from cold storage 
um, that was supposed to go into um, food services into the grocery store. Well, some of these, the way either the cut might be, or more importantly, the packaging and the box size. Um, if you're shipping to a restaurant or to a cruise ship, they're gonna be much larger boxes. They're not gonna be individually packaged. It'll be one label on the outside. So it's, it's not quite as easy as just making that switch and as, as we'd like it to be. I definitely think that we've seen some um, packing houses. I can't speak for lamb specifically, but I would think that they would be that way. As we see our demand changing of what consumers want and into this retail, um, a great example is hamburger. Um, Chuck values have went up a lot. And so you can imagine that they're grinding a lot of product um, to get into these grocery stores right now. The other thing that really hurt the lamb industry with this COVID-19 is that most of our lamb is sold in a very short period of time. So typically um, what you see for a weekly expenditure of, of lamb being sold is about six and a half million dollars is kind of what you would see. And it's kind of steady until we get into Easter. And then it jumps about fourfold. And uh, lamb, as you guys well know, is a huge holiday meat recognized in the Easter, also with some of the other ethnic holidays. And so, um, you know, COVID hit right at the end of March and we're still going through it, but we really lost, we lost the restaurant trade, we lost the Easter, uh, families going out to dinner, or even families getting together and getting that leg of lamb. Most families now maybe only had two people in their household or a small family rather than the big family get together. So instead of going and getting a nice big leg of lamb to cook, um, they may have chose some other product. It could have been lamb or it could have not even been that. So that Easter holiday, not having, you know, it, it would, there was no good time for COVID to hit, but it couldn't have been any worse for the sheep industry. When we look at where our markets were, that we were up tick, we were headed up steady, and we were going into our Easter holidays, that's when we needed to be harvesting lambs, and that's when we needed to be moving lamb to our consumers. And this graph is kind of disappointing that we're already seeing it's got 2020 and then prediction for 2021 because of this food service pullback, um, how consumers are buying and stuff. Uh, we're already seeing that um, our consumption, we have been making some nice daily progress. Granted, we're not big numbers, um, but uh, you know, we had seen a nice little uptake in, in lamb meat um, since 2012. So with this, we're going to see a decrease in consumption. A lot of uh, lamb consumers that we see, they really like lamb. Not all of them are super comfortable cooking it. So, um, you know, that's something that as an industry, um, getting people to, to feel more comfortable cooking it so that they do use it in their homes, that they look for it in the grocery store so that uh, we can keep that consumption up even when we have uh, these restaurant disturbances. Melinda, is there an, a question I need to, I, I'll have to admit, I, to see my um, slides, I went ahead and shut off the, I closed my chat box. So, oh, no worries. You're, I, you're good right now. Okay. So here's the one, and, and this is going to relate back to the pre-COVID and the $17 million worth of lamb meat that we'll talk about. So starting the year with lamb meat, we were pretty much on par for our 2019, um, you know, the amount of lamb in cold storage. It wasn't a huge concern. However, it was a bit up over our averages, but it wasn't bigger than 2019. So there wasn't a lot of discussion around that. However, now there's cold store, our lamb and cold storage, especially certain cuts. I was, um, I didn't put this one on here, but loins especially, there's lots of loins. Loin values have went down uh, considerably. And so we're starting to see this back up in cold storage. And we talk about that $17 million worth of lamb meat purchase. If we could have them come in there and buy some of this lamb and cold storage, that would definitely be helpful. So, you know, we, when that $17 million was authorized for lamb meat, um, we didn't see how critical it would be needed because we didn't have COVID at that time. Now, if we could get that purchase to go forward, 
Um, and I will, will show you later on that it has been um, authorized and they're soliciting. So hopefully we're gonna see that land start to be purchased and get some of that out of our cold storage. Usually it decreases in the spring, just like I had showed you in the previous one because of that high demand for lamb in our, our spring months, especially around Easter, um, seem, seems to help. So really the goal right now with, uh, with that tariff um, mitigation program is to get that $17 million to get, get some of that lamb purchased and get that lamb will go into uh, food banks type of things. It could have went into schools type programs, but with schools shut down, we won't see that. But uh, to try to get some of that lamb out of our cold storage. And um, last I heard is that there is interest from our packers. To, um, they're putting forth bids to, to get some of that lamb moved out. Um, so um, I had indicated in the previous slide, this just came last week, I think from ASI, the approval of this. So, it had been authorized that $17 million to purchase land. The USDA did come out with their um, solicitation for that land purchase. They are gonna purchase 500,000 pounds, which will be about $4 million. Uh, the goal is to have that delivered in July or September. And then there's gonna be, they'll keep having, they'll have more solicitations to meet that $17 million. Um, this has nothing, some of you guys have heard of the COVID assistance um, program where they say that they're gonna purchase meat, um, be it any of the proteins. This 17 million has nothing to do with the, the COVID assistance. This was all with the trade assistance. So um, kind of keep that in mind that, that we, we gotta keep these different. This one is, is on, on the trade tariff assistant program. So um, when we talk about uh, lamb slaughter, here's what COVID did. And uh, basically, uh, especially the Wolverine plant up in Michigan, it was not operating um, consistently for about three weeks. So we had a lot of lambs backing up off of there. Um, we also saw efficiencies lost in our packing plants, not just because we had decreased workers. Some of them were sick, some of them were scared to be sick. And then we have people who had to stay home to take care of their kids. But also um, they've had to change um, how we have some of our fabrication floors, putting up shields and masks. And you know, one of the things that we've been able to do in the US and our meat industry is have a lot of efficiency so that uh, we can harvest these animals in a humane fashion quickly, but that we can also do it without um, uh, having huge fabrication rooms. Um, typically those, those rooms with the people who are meat cutting, they might kind of look like a snake type of deal or people stand across from each other. And so, um, you know, when packing plants had to make, uh, do some protection for those workers, we lost some efficiencies uh, there. Harvest was down about 35%. We did have some, um, you know, in the East Coast, we had some people not fabricating, macho um, wasn't taking lambs. Uh, we also had another, uh, we had the unfortunate um, situation with Mountain Plains Rosen and a bankruptcy filing and filing for protection. And so they were having to operate different. They're the ones that kind of got caught in some of this meat that was moving back to the East Coast um, where there, there was sales, but then there was no sales and the meat then had to come back. And so, you know, it wasn't all, you know, we were worried about our packing plants, but also um, back in the east where they break carcasses down, a lot of those were closed down. So there was no fabrication of these carcasses to then go into, uh, you know, either our grocery stores. And we certainly weren't going into um, restaurants at that time. So um, I ended up leaving both of these um, graphs on here. The first graph, the smaller one, is when I gave this presentation um, about a month ago to um, the Washington producers. And I was really concerned about, you know, that big dip, that 35% dip in harvest, um, <clears throat> being that uh, Wolverine wasn't operating, our decreased efficiency in packing plants. 
And seeing what I was seeing here in our Pacific Northwest uh, cattle feeding feedlots, um, I was worried we could start to see a lot of lambs backing up in the feedlot. And, you know, that's problematic for a lot of reasons. It costs money to feed these lambs. If we get lambs out of their optimal, um, not only are we going to have to trim these lambs because we'll have more fat, but you got to remember with the lambs, we were at a very close age break. We don't want to get into that yearly mutton. There's not as high a demand for that. And so I, I was really concerned that uh, this, uh, when I was looking at this in April with the closures that we were seeing um, without restaurants opening up, that this was just going to keep going up and we were going to have more animals on feed and, you know, and we were going to be over our capacity and, and, you know, we're, we're kind of concerned, we're especially concerned in our, our hog feeding operations where we've hit capacity, but even in our cattle feeding um, operations, when we can't get these steers moved out, we can't bring new, new animals in. So the good news I think that we're seeing is that, you know, um, there, there was a tight supply as it was, so there was not a whole lot of lambs going into the feedlot. Most of the people are lambing in that January, February time, so we shouldn't see lambs really coming in. But it's good to see that lambs, um, the Wolverine plant, my understanding is it's back up and operational and is moving. Um, our efficiencies are still in question, but at least we're not seeing lamb back up in the feedlot. Um, that we're keeping those lambs moving out of there. So here's the impact on the live prices. Uh, when we look at the live price here, uh, especially starting in April when we didn't have uh, the, the, the restaurant demand, we weren't able to harvest those animals, just like in the other proteins, be it pork or beef, we saw a drastic decrease in price. Um, anywhere from 40%, some, uh, sometimes at certain weeks at certain sale yards. Um, I heard, you know, some of our big ones like the, the South Dakota one, that it was almost half of what it had been prior to March. So um, uh, dropped really quickly. We have seen some jumps up. However, I'll show you a little bit later. It, it's sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell what that jump means. It, it doesn't mean that we're going forward or was there so few of lambs, any trade was good. Um, and then we see it come back down. Um, there was definitely reports out of California where they couldn't even get bids on lambs um, in this time frame. Um, they had lambs to move but couldn't get bids. And, and the real concern uh, for our California guys is a lot of them will lamb in that late, late fall, winter, and we'll be having lambs that are ready to come into that feedlot, ready to get fed, ready to go to harvest in May, um, June type of time. So if we can get these plants back to operating, um, that's what we really need to do um, it, with some efficiency because those lambs will start coming. Um, our Washington lambs will start heading to um, Dixon in, in end of July, uh, first of August will be, be, be their kind of time to go in. But um, you know, if you're a, a a pat, if you're a, a shed lammer in, in Idaho and don't lamb until January, February, um, those little guys are just headed out to the mountain. Um, if you're pasture lambing, you're just dropping lambs right now. And so, uh, so you've got some time on your side. But uh, those are some things. This price, uh, this graph over here just slows the, shows the hot carcass weight. And it, it basically what we expected to see is it's about double. But you can see we were tracking up nicely and then um, it just came down uh, really quickly. And we haven't seen any kind of upturn yet um, on a consistent basis. So this is my, uh, and, and this comes from our ASI president, Benny Cox, who, uh, who operates the San Angelo um, markets. When you're reading these market reports, you kind of have to use caution right now because our numbers are being skewed in, in the amount of animals that are coming in. Um, so we saw this big jump here. Um, I think that was, you know, the second week of April or third week of April. It, it just really jumped up really quick. And there, 
what they were saying is be careful. There was a really good estimate demand at that Texas auction, and there wasn't a lot of numbers. So it may have not have been a, a true reflection. And then you saw it come back down, and now we've had a little bit of a jump up. Uh, the reality is it's, it's very volatile. And um, I can't speak on the Idaho market. I, I'm not well versed on it. What uh, we we're seeing in Washington is that um, there was decent demand for some coal used into our ethnic market, but any of the older crop lambs, um, lambs kind of being held over, there was, there was really no demand for them. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of interest. Surprisingly, our goat markets were, were holding up pretty good. Um, I talked to a producer out of Oregon last week, and you know, I, I have a small flock of ewes here in the basin, and um, right last couple weeks, I've had lots of people stopping wanting coal ewes. Um, but I talked to the producer in Oregon, and they said they, they didn't have a market for coal ewes, you know, just trying to market them through the uh, livestock auctions. There was nobody really doing, um, moving those into kind of our ethnic, people who handle those ethnic um, harvests for them. So I, I don't know what you guys are seeing in Idaho from a, a coal use standpoint, but it seems to be all over the board depending on your location and sale and even week to week, uh, seeing lots of variation that way. So um, across the US, there seems to be a lot of variation in prices. Um, there seems to be a lot of producers that aren't really hard pressed to go to the sale yards, sell their coal use, to sell lambs yet, kind of wait and see because they, they don't want to go there and then not have somebody want to buy them. Um, in the auction, it all depends on who shows up. Um, I saw at our local auction here last week, coal use were bringing $130 a head, um, you know, a good black face shoe type of deal, which I don't think is, is a bad market this time of year. I mean, she wasn't super fleshy or heavy. So uh, what we do see is that there's uh, not really any contract buyers from packers. They're looking for lambs to fill their need. They were able to get enough of those out of the packing plants and, and producers who had some backed up. So um, the auctions, it all kind of depends, and hopefully we'll see some leveling out. I will say in, in my area, it seems like is the auction place is where people um, like to get out of um, out of the uh, house and, and go. Uh, there's, it seems like there's a lot of activity there and, and animals moving, but also buyers just watch, maybe not even buyers, but people just watching, even though they've discouraged that. Um, as I said, it varies um, by, by state, what we're seeing on the call you market. Um, between 45 cents and 65 is kind of what I've heard up here in, in the upper Pacific Northwest um, and just very little demand for, for older lambs. When it comes to show lambs, we have quite a few uh, junior shows up here in Washington and um, even California has some early fairs. So, you know, those show lambs coming off, um, usually they will go into a, a Buy, a turn buyer will buy them. They'll either go into our ethnic trade over in the Seattle area or they'll drop down into the Packer in Oregon or some even make their way down to Dixon, California with Superior. Um, most of those fairs were, were canceled and so kids were marketing their lambs themselves. But also from a show lamb perspective, um, I haven't seen a lot of kids backing out yet. Um, I think you guys in Idaho are, are talking about having fairs. But probably in Washington now, I, I can't say off the top of my head, but a good number have canceled fares. And so um, the question is, should they get a lamb or not get a lamb? Um, typically in the Pacific Northwest, you know, most of us aren't lambing until that January, February time. So a lot of us don't have lambs ready to go. Unless you were holding lambs over from last year, you were a pasture lammer doing some feed outs into the packing um, or into the feedlots to sell directly into those packing houses in March. Um, there's not a whole lot of lamb movement. And, and some of the markets, the people who had lambs to sell um, up in this area, we're fortunate that uh, prices and demands were good in February. There's lots of activities um, from, from buyers and, and they fortunately sold at that time. So they haven't seen, at least we haven't seen that impact. And so I can't talk about what's happening down there in Southern Idaho with your uh, larger flocks 
um, and how that has, but I, I suspect if you had lambs in the feedlot or lambs scheduled to go into one of those plants, it has been much harder on you guys than it was for us up here. So the other concern around harvest and demand, especially the impact that it is having on um, our plant slowdown. We're definitely not running at the efficient level, the number of heads that we have through there. And like I said, it, it's, it's multiple tiered. It's not only um, uh, up here in Washington at our Tyson plant, we did have uh, some testing positive. We also had people calling in. We had higher call out rates um, because either people were scared to get sick or they had family members that they needed to take care of at home. Um, but we also have some inefficiencies that have been put in, um, just having to create uh, greater space, um, how we're working on that chain to get animals fabricated. And so that, that has created some, some issues in that sense. Um, I, I'll tell you, it was really hard for me about three weeks ago to see my emails coming in. Like I said, I work with the, I, I basically represent the Washington pork producers and do all their programming. And, and luckily we don't have any DPOP situations, but we interact a lot with the Midwest. And to see the reality that they were being faced with um, makes you start to think when you hear packing plants closing out here or like what we were seeing in the Midwest. And, and the question is, how do we handle backups in the sheep industry and with sheep feedlots? And I think, you know, we're somewhat fortunate in that we're not in that confinement situation that we see with chickens and uh, pork. Um, we, we have a little bit easier time either just slowing those animals down or if we don't have to bring them to the feedlot, if we can find pasture, um, we could have stayed out on pasture. So we haven't had to talk about the depop like we have in um, our swine um, industry like we did, or, or we're not having to talk about that. But I think it's really important to remind people, you know, when we talk about, it's really sad to see um, potatoes going to waste, being thrown away, onions, all those things. Animals, we can't just dump them. You know, it's gonna require a, a, a organized plan um, nobody wants to talk about euthanasia, no one wants to talk about depopulation, and then we have to talk about um, how we handle those carcasses. And so I always remind the people outside our animal ag industry, us handling animals that we have no market for is much more complex, especially when we put the animal welfare issue on top of that. Um, and, and people um, Maybe seeing those pictures are really hard, or you know, animals that you know, steers that are just getting way too heavy for um, them to carry themselves. The other thing that we have to really consider, you know, in our operation, there's a lot of people that feed um, feed out lambs, and we're not integrated like the hog operations where they own all the way from um, you know one entity owns from the farrowing barn up to the the packing house. But a lot of our feeders have, um, you know, a ewe flock and they will buy feeder lambs to feed out. And so the question will be, if they lose a significant amount of money here in the first quarter, even if we get things turned around, what type of buying power will they have? I mean, if they lost money and they owe the bank money, they're probably not going to have a lot of money to come for. So we really need this to turn around for all segments of our industry, um, our feeders and our packers, because if they lose money now, their likelihood to be able to buy lambs later, even as we come out of this, might be concerning. The other concerns that I have is, is lamb, as I stated earlier, is a high protein. If consumers are losing their jobs, they don't have as much money, are they gonna be more price sensitive? Um, I'll have to admit, I was in our grocery store the other day and I saw oxtails selling for $7.49 a pound and fry tips selling for $7.99 a pound. So watching how people buy is really interesting to me. Um, I, I can't say that I understand it, um, but I think that's something we want to be aware of in the lamb industry. We are a higher price point protein and, um, you know, people are out sourcing and if they have limited incomes. The other real concern, and I, I don't know what you guys are seeing in the, the, uh, these other regions, but definitely here in Washington, um, we are seeing restaurants that just weren't closed, they're now going out of business or they're not gonna open up under some of these new requirements they say they can't make 
money. So, um, you know, if we have restaurant closures, they don't reopen, they go out of business, will somebody come in and, and buy that restaurant? Um, so those are concerns we see as going forward because as I showed you earlier, there's a lot of uh, a lamb meat that we need to move through that food service and, and through our cruises and cruises aren't moving either. So um, we move a lot of meat that way. So those are concerns. So this uh, map is, Oh, probably two, three weeks old. This show, this is um, packing plants. These are mostly pork and beef packing plants in the U.S. And uh, that shows what was open, what was reopening, and what was closed. Up where I'm at, you can see here in Washington, we had our Tyson plant closed. We had our AV plant open. Um, I can. I can tell you stories of producers that are still holding cattle, feedlots that are trying to figure out how to move cattle, 10 head of cattle moving to a custom slaughter guy and, and another guy coming in. So it's, it's been a, definitely a different industry, but um, you can see we had a lot of uh, closures and we did have some reopenings. Um, up here, our red has now turned back to would be what is green were reopened up here at Tyson. Um, and, and hopefully we'll continue to move forward and get back up to um, the level of harvest that we saw before this uh, took place. Uh, the one thing that's going to be concerning with our packing plants is can we ever get back to our efficiencies that we had? Um, a lot of them are talking, you know, without uh, a vaccine, you're going to need a lot of personal protective equipment in those packing plants. Um, that's going not only is that going to cost money, but it could also take down efficiencies, not being able to quite work as well. So um, this is a real concern of, of how we move forward because of how close proximity they are um, between health districts and trying to keep employees from getting sick. I think the reality is that we're going to have to see, uh, we will have uh, personal protection equipment in, in those packing plants at much higher levels than we've ever seen before. So here's some of the assistance programs that are available for you guys out there um, concerning uh, the coronavirus. The USDA has authorized direct payments of 16 million, uh, or 16 million, I think it's million, I thought maybe it was billion. I think it's billion, I think I have a typo there. And three billion to food purchases. Uh, the thing that you're gonna wanna do is make sure that the sign up was supposed to be here in May is to be making sure that you have all your records, get down to your local farm service agency so that when you can sign up for these details, um, they'll be available. Um, ASI is gonna make those available, but I'm sure uh, Melinda and Carmen with U of I will also forward you those as they come available. Some other things that are available, these are more complex, um, especially for some of you larger operations. Um, there are some, some resources available. There's what we call the PPP, the Payment Protection Plan for small businesses. It can either be a guaranteed loan to help support payroll um, during this time. The problem is if you have herders, they have to have residency of the U.S. So our H-2A workers don't fall under this. ASI has been sending letters to Congress, as you guys are well aware that most of our um, Western U flock is, um, is handled by herders and, and that's our large payroll there. So this program was meant to help some of the ag people. Um, however, it's not helping us in the sheep sense side of things if you have um, H2A workers because their primary residency would be outside the US. Um, there's also um, economic injury disaster advance loans. And this one, what I'm hearing is a little bit, there is a possibility that your H2A workers could fall under this. Um, it doesn't ask for some of the specifics. Um, and you can get up to, I think it's $10,000, uh, $1,500 per employee. Don't quote me on some of those details. Um, get on either ASI or go to your local lender and ask them about those. But those are some programs that are in place to help, especially with the payroll and help with uh, 
loss of revenue um, because of this. And so those are some places that you could bring some cash flow into your operation. Um, some other issues that we're seeing in the sheep industry is getting our H-2A herders back into the U.S. because of some um, embassies or uh, yeah, they're closed down along with uh, just travel. Um, it seems like a lot of the Western flocks I'm hearing they're down one or two herders per operation um, because of this travel. So this is a very difficult time not to have a herder because a lot of you guys were lambing, you were either shearing, or now you're getting ready to go out on your allotments and um, you, you're, those guys are critical for those, those things to happen. And um, without certain herders, can we, you know, um, our grazing allotment size are, are somewhat of a concern because um, for a couple operations I've talked with, they don't have enough herders for the number, how their head size allotments need to be to go out onto the forest service. I was on a call with the U.S. Forest Service a couple of weeks ago. I will say that uh, they were being very proactive. They had a lot of language that they were wanting to make sure that um, producers were not going to be negatively impacted on a timely turnout because of stay-at-home orders, people working from home. They were doing everything from collecting electric signatures, um, trying to discuss how they would handle monitoring details uh, from afar, to make sure that these animals um, got out in a timely fashion. I know in my discussions with them, I, I reminded them that we were already seeing backups at packing plants and um, we definitely needed to get, make sure that we got out in a timely fashion so we didn't have animals uh, standing around because we you know, uh, didn't have places necessarily for them to go, um, especially on our cattle, cattle operations and stuff. Uh, like I said, there is a, a concern that with decreased number of herders um, that, you know, some can only put out 800 head on an allotment or 1,000 um, if we can go ahead and, and combine or move those up. Uh, we really haven't gotten a good answer here up in Washington State necessarily, but I can tell you the Forest Service was very proactive in, in hearing what our concerns were, hearing what um, hardships were happening without those herders here. Uh, so we'll see how that moves forward. One thing that I want to bring up that is just came to light, and I think that uh, as sheep producers, we want to really watch this. Um, I'll tell you what, Australia, I know, has been very negatively affected by us not having our restaurants right, not having um, lamb on the menu. And they definitely want to see us get back to having our restaurants open. But there's a lot of interest, uh, trade negotiations um, were to open up with the UK. A lot of the sheep farmers definitely want a trade opened up for lamb into the US. Um, if you remember, oh, probably about a year ago when this was brought up uh, to our secretary of the USDA um, about lamb, he didn't see concerns with it. And that created a lot of enthusiasm by UK farmers to get lamb over here. Um, the problem is, uh, especially as with this Brexit exit come, they need lamb to move here because they'll lose some of their other markets. Um, UK lamb is very highly subsidized. We already bring over half of our lamb in, imported in. Uh, most of that's coming from Australia and New Zealand. So there's concern there. Uh, we also have concerns from a disease standpoint. We've basically almost eradicated scrapie. Um, we were able to get back into a Japan market um, that we had been shut out for, for quite some time because of those TSE and BSE type diseases. Um, and uh, you know, New Zealand and Australia don't have those issues. So definitely watching, watching that there. All this has come, I'll have to admit, I've been with Washington State University 20 years. I don't, the first mad cow case in the US was in my area. Um, the Q fever break that happened and, and got the CDC involved. Uh, I don't know, I, I've been involved in four or five um, animal quarantine, big animal quarantines from um, a disease outbreak standpoint. And, and a few of the scrapey ones. So we had been preparing and talking about foot and mouth disease, never ever really thought about a human impact 
um, always thought this this type of impact we're seeing would have come from uh, like especially foot and mouth disease. Um, so I think this hits home that if it's this bad with uh, COVID and some of the things we're seeing, um, you know, we definitely got to keep our eyes open and, and what the impact would be with a foreign animal disease. We got to keep those out. But I think also we got to be prepared and make sure that we not only have a record keeping system and infrastructure in place so that if a disease hits in a certain area that we can go ahead and control that quickly and uh, have continuous business moving so other operations aren't impacted by it. So ASI has worked with Iowa State. They have um, these plans for beef, pork, chicken, dairy. And it's called the she Secure Sheep and Wool Plan. And it's basically um, a record keeping system. It helps you walk through plans to have in place so that hopefully you you have these documents ready that if we have a forest shutdown because of some foreign animal diseases, that you'll have that in place and you can continue to move those animals and continue to manage them and market them as you see fit. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, sheep resources for COVID, go on to the ASI website. It's right there on the first one. You click on it and you can go to all these different ones that we'll talk about you know, um, the PPP program, the wool loan deficiency program, uh, what will happen when we get the, uh, um, the care program out for the COVID. So those will all come available there. Um, some people have asked, what can you do from the standpoint right now? And I, I would say for most of us, if you did not own lambs going into, into, into March, um, most of us, time is on our side because most of us were just starting to lamb. Um, these lambs aren't going to be ready for, for, you know, until late summer or fall. So hopefully time is on our side. Um, if we don't have these packing plants figured out by then, we're going to be in a world of hurt. So hopefully um, time is on our side. We didn't have a, a lot of producers didn't have a lot of lambs to market. There were producers out there, and I don't, I don't want to make light of that. But especially the farm flocks, um, they probably don't have very many to market that were market ready. And then if you were had already sold your lambs for 2019, starting up your lambing weren't holding a lot. But some of the things that you can do is um, definitely no need to try to push on trying to get into this early market. Um, there was uh, plenty of lambs that were there. So if you have, have pasture, use time, let things settle in the market, see how things are happening. Um, but be aware that, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that prices are going to go back to pre-COVID. They might be better. They might be worse. Um, some producers, um, regardless of size, you're going to have to look, is it, is it more beneficial to go ahead and sell those animals um, now if we're headed into a drought situation and you're going to have to buy feed or, or bring them in? Um, also competition from other proteins, those sorts of things. So it's really gonna be a time that you have to get your pencil out and kind of look at your options and move through those and, and try to make some decisions that work for you there. Um, even in uh, good times, um, it's just like in uncertain times, it's worth getting rid of those low producing animals, animals that cost you time and resources. Um, we really don't know what the coal market's going to be, so that's not a big market. Uh, usually for a lot of operations, it might be worth just getting them off the books and getting them moved if you can get somebody to take them, uh, especially if we have a drought and limited feed. And we were talking in the beginning, it sounded like Idaho was experiencing dry just like we are here in Washington. Um, this direct niche marketing, you know, a lot of times we thought that was more for our small to medium sized um, operations. I will admit I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing semi loads of pigs come out from the Midwest here to Washington being custom harvested. I suspect there's some in Idaho too. Um, also our feedlots and trying to get some of those big heavy cattle out and because of some local demand, uh, we're seeing cattle instead of going to our big packing plants being pulled out in trailer loads, headed off to, to uh, custom butchers or even small 
federal inspected plants for people to buy locally. So there, there is a lot of enthusiasm around local. So I think you have an ability to market that way. When I say a few, I'm, I'm just talking about it being a percentage of your flock. You have a small flock, you, you could maybe do them all, but if you're running five, 10,000 ewes, that might be a lot of lambs to try to market directly. Um, and one of the things I'm gonna tell people is even though we're um, small and local, we're still finding some of the same issues uh, we have labor shortages. Uh, you know, we were already short on custom harvest here in the Pacific Northwest before COVID. Just not a lot of um, uh, mobile butchers or even federal slaughter. And a lot of them have limited freezer capacity, especially if they're hanging beef and need to hang them for two weeks. But we also up here in uh, Spokane and in central Washington, we saw a run on personal freezers. Um, you can't find a personal freezer, and in Spokane in one day, 700 um, home freezers were sold, and most of that was because people were getting, a, you know, they were either buying a lot of stuff at the grocery store, but a lot of them were buying either a, a pig or a steer uh, to put into the freezer. So you still want to make sure that you're um, talking with those people and have a slaughter date. Um, I know that even our cattle ones out here are two months out. Um, on our, our local custom. Um, added cost, make sure you can cover your price. Um, by the time you transport them, you pay for the, the slaughter fee, the harvest fee, the time, the risk. Um, sometimes it, what you'll have to charge, people don't wanna pay. Um, and that's why I say, are the people good for the money? And there's a lot of people that will say, yes, yes, I want one, I want one, but then when it comes down to it, um, they either don't have the money or don't want to pay it. And a lamb is a little bit easier because it's just not the size. I see that happen more with beef cattle uh, when they realize they have a $2,000 um, bill. That's a lot of money to come up with. At least the lamb is a little bit um, in a price, a total price value that it's a little bit easier for people to, to uh, have. And last but not least, I would say, you know, we need to stay optimistic, but be realistic. Um, you guys, um, uh, like I said, I've been here 20 years. I grew up in Idaho. Um, it's uh, an industry that I love. It's an industry that I see incredibly hard workers, uh, very creative people um, that are able to think outside the box. Uh, so you come through tough times before. Um, I, I, I believe that you will do it again. It's, it's not going to be easy and I'm not going to make light of that. Um, don't count on the government assistance to cover all your losses. Um, I always keep thinking of where are they going to get all this money to, to do all these things they promise. Um, but hopefully some of this assistance can help you get through these tough periods or, or make some um, uh, payments that need to be made so that you can make some other decision. Uh, again, manage sheep for production efficiency and health. You know, a dead sheep is still worth zero, six sheep are get discounted. So in even harder economic times, we want to make sure that uh, we have healthy, productive sheep um, that perform and, and hang up good carcasses that our consumers want to eat. Uh, and last, the thing I leave you with is, you know, I think you guys are going to have to think outside the box. You've done that. I indicated that earlier. Like I said, um, there's a feedlots. I'm watching them as they, as they load up steers and send them places. And, you know, that's not our ideal situation. We usually like to go directly to the big packing plants but uh, they're doing what they have to do to make things work. And I put down the wool gator mask. I, you guys can see that I have one on. When they talk about the mask um, first coming available, my family, we've wore these wool gators for the last, I don't know, four or five years. Um, these cold winters, we run cattle and we, we have just a few head of sheep, a, a small farm flock, but mostly cattle and wheat operation. And so we wear these all the time. And when I heard the mask thing, I knew it was gonna be a complete disaster to think that my parents would wear a mask anywhere. So I went online and I bought some extra gaiters for us to have going into this, this mask requirement. And I wasn't for sure it was gonna be a, a full-fledged thing. Uh, two weeks later, I went on and I couldn't find any wool gaiters uh, or, or neck things. So there are certain, certain things that are selling, are moving. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's lamb, but I, I think uh, trying to take advantage of the local 
um, those opportunities are, are what I would consider. So with that. And um, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, of course, follow us on our, face page, our Facebook, our YouTube channel and our webpage for more information. And next week we're going to have Glenn Shoemaker, who's our extension forage specialist, give us a little information on improving our irrigated pastures uh, by popular demand. Uh, you guys are all wondering what to plant for your sheep and goats and how to uh, make a better pasture for them. So stay tuned for that next week. And um, thanks again to everybody.